Hello again. My name is Charles Sabo. This is webinar 18 of a 24 day webinar on the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm uh, doing it from the book that I'm writing called the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. Currently writing it. I'm on chapter 21, so I'm almost finished. Um, today we're going to be doing chapter 17, which um, is a very interesting chapter, very controversial. I will be hated by Catholics, but I'm only going to tell the truth, tell the way it is. And so hopefully some Catholics will learn from this if they are going to watch it, because it tells them a lot about what's happening in these last days. Now, the um, PDF that I'm doing will have some mistakes on it. Please forgive me for that. I'm an author that's still doing editing. I do all my editing, and so I've only done one edit, so I've got several more edits to do before it moves to print. So um, anyway, as we get into this and you like my video, please don't hesitate to hit like. I'm going to tell you now. Um, and then um, always subscribe to my, my um, channel so that you can get updates of other videos that are coming out. So um, I'm going to show you the PDF right now. And there it is. And so we're going to start right into the Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 17. And I'm going to take you right into for the beginning in Genesis 11:4, where we start with the uh, beginning of the mystery religion. So we can know what the mystery religion is, since Mystery Babylon the Great is part of the mystery religion. And so, <clears throat> verse. 4 of, of Genesis 11 and they said go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth the building of the tower of Babel was an event which caused the Lord to take action this union of the entire population of humanity was too early in his timeline he scattered the entire population of mankind and assigned their languages to their separate locations that they had been driven to they had brought with them the memories of their worship and taught their offspring the religions of the people who had been scattered were in remembrance of their worship king queen and son now Nimrod, his, his mother slash wife Samarabus, and their son Tammuz had become legendary. Because the, the languages differed, the names had changed in that religion. The people of Israel had been influenced to worship that same language that had originated in the land of Shinar. We can read of the woman of, of Israel weeping for Tammuz because of the legend of his death. Ezekiel 8 verse 14 says then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house which was toward the north and behold there were women weeping for Tammuz so you can see even the mystery religion snuck its way into uh, Israel this religion has been remained has remained and, and, and integrated itself into ma the major cultures of the of the earth. They they became the gods of Egypt, Greece, and Rome. They are now they now are worshipped by the Roman Catholic Church in the form of the Father, the Son, and Mother Mary. Semiramis has been worshipped under the names of Ishtar, Ashtoreth, Astarte, Rhea, Isis, and Mary, to name just a few, while Nimrod has been known as Milcom, Chamash, Ninus, Osiris, and Baal, and and I believe that there's one I'm missing, I know there is of a common one, um, Marduk or whatever. Um, Tammuz is also known as Horus and Adonis. Now, 1 Kings 11.33 says, Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, there's Samaramis right there, the goddess of the Zidonians, Shemash, the god of Moabites, Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in my eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did David his father. Now, you can see God was a little frustrated. Um, with the people going to mystery religion. Um, Satan and his occult followers grasped into the, uh, the, that religion and the masonry symbolism of the building of the Tower of Babel, which had originated in Shinar. 
after the destruction of the Canaanites, then the scattering of the people through the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, the mystery religion became an underground religion while also hiding within the Roman Greco mythology. Now, as Romans persecuted and killed the Christians in the first three centuries, the church flourished and spread like wildfire. Roman emperors such as Titus and Nero had burned Christians on crosses, as well as feeding them to lions for entertainment. When a city was attacked while looking for the secretly worshipping Christians, the Christians would flee out of the city into the other cities. They would, they would preach God's good news of salvation in Christ like a wildfire, and Christianity was spreading quickly. In the spiritual realm, as Christianity became more persecuted, it seemed to flourish. Christians will always seek the Lord for his guidance and help in times like those. Now I'm going to go into a, this, a, uh, a little skit on um, how the Greco-Roman Empire came to be. Um, I'm going to start here in Daniel before they even existed. Daniel prophesied of the um, fourth kingdom. Um, the fourth of the four kingdoms that um, Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt about, the statue. Well, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and, to, and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all things shall it break in pieces and bruise. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, parts of the potter's clay, and parts of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. So you can go and do a little, a little research on the book of Daniel. I wrote a, a, a book on the prophecy of Daniel several years ago um, and broke that down. Um, Daniel 2.40 speaks of the fourth kingdom that is strong as iron. This fourth kingdom is now known as the Roman Empire. It should be referred to realistically as the Grecian Roman Empire since the Greek Empire was taken over control by the Roman government system and evolved into an empire that eventually brought its own Roman rulers to reign about 45 BC with Julius Caesar. It is recognized that 27 BC was the official start of the Roman supremacy under Octavius who appoints himself Augustus which means the first emperor. The transition that occurs between the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire is in further prophecies of Daniel in chapter 7 and 8, as well as in a thorough, precise prophecy in Daniel 11. Daniel chapter 11 reveals the wars that would occur to bring the disintegration of the Greek Empire, which then evolved into the eventual dominance of the Grecian Roman Empire. In, in AD 312, Roman Emperor Constantine the Great became convinced that he was a Christian upon the occurrence of an event. Asubius of Caesarea and other Christian sources recorded the Constantine experience as a dramatic event in 312 at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. After this event, Constantine claimed the emperorship in the West. According to these sources, Constantine looked up to the sun before the battle and saw a cross of light above it. Within the light of the cross were the Greek words ev Toftu Nika, and this sign conquer, which is often rendered in the Latin version in hoc signo vince, in this sign you will conquer. Constantine commanded his troops to adorn their shields with the Christian symbol, the chi ro, and thereafter they were victorious. Christianity became Rome's newfound religion of their king, which became also within his governmental system. It was then legal to be Christian. When interpreting Daniel 2.41, one needs to take into consideration what was described first in verse 33 of chapter 2. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. The legs of iron are the most, are of the, oh, I'm sorry, the legs of iron are of a different strength and obviously of the different time period. Most will agree that the Roman Empire fulfilled this part of the statue in full between 27 BC and 393 BC, uh, AD, I'm sorry. Um, Diocletian ruled 284 to 305 and established the Tetrarchy in 294 AD, naming Maximinius as co-Augustus and Galerius and Constantinius as two subordinate Caesars. This experiment in sharing power power sharing, lasted only a short time. Constantinus, son of Constantine the Great, with dynastic ambitions of his own, set about defeating his imperial rivals and eventually reunited the West 
western and eastern halves of the empire in 324. He then founded a new capital on Bosphorus at Byzantium, which was renamed Constantinople in his honor in 330 AD. A political power shifted to Constantinople, the development of the Roman Catholic Church and papacy gradually replaced declining civil authority at Rome. The German tribes who lived along the northern borders of the empire had long been recruited to serve as mercenaries in the Roman Empire, began to merge, emerge as powerful political and military forces in their own right. In the 370s, the Huns, the horsemen of the Eurasian steppe, invaded areas along the Danube River, driving many of the Germanic tribes, which included the Visigoths, the Visigoths, I'm sorry, into the Roman provinces, which began as a controlled resettlement of barbarians within the empire's borders, ended as an invasion and the fall of the Roman dominance. The majority of theologians wanted to declare that the Roman Empire was defeated and fell in 393, and that it will be revived in the, in the end times. Nowhere in the scriptures does it imply the fall of the fourth kingdom until God destroys it in Revelation 18. So I will argue that point of it falling in 393 and then having to come back. I will argue that and I'll, just, I'll demonstrate that r real quick here. Something cannot rise again if it had not fallen to begin with. One should realize that it didn't take long for mo modern Roman Catholicism principles, which would govern them, to take place. Many historians suggest that Pope Leo I is the first to claim universal jurisdiction over the worldwide church. You know, the, the, the dates, 440 to 461, uh, around the time that the Roman Empire was uh, transferring from its tectarchy to um, its... Um, it's um, theocracy, thus initiating the rise of papacy, a uniquely Roman cultural Catholic structure. The Roman Empire, Fourth Kingdom, transitioned from a monarchy to a tetrarchy between 284 and 393, and then transitioned to a theocracy between 393 and 440. The papacy of the Roman Catholic Church has ruled the earth from Rome since this time. And remember this comment here because you'll find this stated in Revelation 17. Um, because the occult religion of the mysteries had already integrated itself among the Greek Hellenism community, it became the majority religion of Rome before Christianity, Christianity entered the scene. Newly converted Christians found it hard to let go of their worship of their idols. Their stories within their old religion of Hellenism mingled itself into their worship of Jesus and his mother Mary. Idolatry was a must within Rome, and the Christianity had, and Christianity had converted into a cult, or occult, right in the epicenter of the world. In retrospect, with the Roman Empire had weakened, there came a change in its leadership structure. As one looks back with hindsight, one will notice that the divided Greek Empire and its cultural dominance never was defeated and seemed to evolve into the Roman Empire. The Greek city-states had to be united by force, first through the invasion of the Macedonians and then by the Romans. Because the Greek culture was more sophisticated, their learning and philosophy more advanced, Roman culture would be overcome as the Roman immersed, Romans immersed itself in the, into the cultural influences of the Hellenistic East. In the final outcome, as the Roman Empire declined in the West, Roman emperors transferred their capital from Italy to Asia Minor, in the east. With the Roman emperors focused on the east, a blend of Roman and Greek culture, which was centered in the city of Constantinople, did endure. The Greek culture and its Hellenistic religion remained and was adopted into the culture of the Roman Empire. It then evolved into the blended religion of the Roman Catholicism. One can then understand that Hellenism, that evolved through Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, remained the dominant religion through the Roman monarchical empire. It then integrated into a false Christianity, which became the Hellenistic Roman Catholic theocracy of today. Chapter 17 introduces God's explanation to his church of the imposter in the world who has deceived the multitudes of people. As this chapter unfolds, the correlation with the events of the seven years of the 70th week of Daniel is disclosed as God is prepared to pour his wrath on the whore writing the world system. So there you have a history lesson. This is how Roman Catholicism came into be. 
this is how, this is how they came to be married with the mystery religion and then became a false form of Christianity a false church um, though there are Christians in Roman Catholicism I will admit it there are many Christians in Roman Catholicism since there's 1.2 billion uh, Catholics if I had to guess 100 million maybe 50 million Christians in there don't don't know but right now we'll move on with, with uh, chapter 17 verse 1 and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come here I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters one of the seven cherubim angels had who had poured out the seven vials came to John and requested for him to come here the cherub was sent to John to show him the judgment which God had been re been reminded of to do next as stated within Revelation 16 19 to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath is what 16 19 actually says he calls her a great whore which reveals that the Lord considers the great Babylon of 1619 to be the church as well typically when the scriptures speaks of a religion or church it is given a female gender using female pronouns as well um, I'm gonna go into something that has to do with the mystery religion Isaiah 13 22 talks about it and since there's where the coming of the wrath is coming is 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 in, in the um, is destined for the mystery religion um, you can see how Isaiah puts it the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant places and her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged the appearance of wild beasts and lizards in Isaiah 13 22 would coincide with the abandoned and desolate land the wilderness so to speak the 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 whore, the, the whore that rides the 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 scarlet colored beast in the wilderness uh, think of it that way the desolate the, the God's not blessing the intent of the verse is more than a literal condition of the land it is spiritual significance as well as prophetic the Hebrew word e can also be translated as jackal a jackal was a spiritual guide in Egyptian mythology a mythological spiritual guide jackal of the occult cries or howls in the desolate house of spiritual Babylon the dragons or serpents are dwelling in their pleasant places or otherwise in the wealth and comfort of the global elite and the occult the word her is used for used here as a feminine reference to there in the previous statement usually when Bible prophecy refers to an entity as a woman it usually depicts a religion in in Revelation 17 Mr. Babylon the Great is the whore that rides the beast the religion of the occult is connected with this prophecy and links to spiritual Babylon within the seven year 70th week of Daniel when Isaiah implies her time is near to come the time draws close to the great tribulation and her destruction when the time comes there will be no change of plans nor counter move to allow for additional time of ruling over the earth her days shall not be prolonged as Isaiah said now the cherub angel tells John that the great whore sits upon many waters if you will look ahead to verse 17 15 chapter 17 verse 15 it was disclosed that the many waters were allegory for multitudes of people nations and tongues so this religious sect called the great whore is in the midst of involved with many nations and multitudes of people now so far we haven't narrowed it down have we we because you can put Muslim in here Islam you can put Mormonism you can put Buddhism along with Roman Catholicism in the group because it, they do take they, they do sit on many many waters right many people so we'll go into verse 2 that starts to narrow things down with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have made have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication now within this verse it is an indication of the great whore's crimes she has seduced the kings of the earth into idolatry with her so the for, spiritual fornication since the inhabitants of the earth follow their leaders kings they too fall into the same idolatry they fall for it hook line and sinker they are born raised and learned to do as their leaders do the kings of the earth worship in their temples performing the same adulterous acts that the church leadership do the intoxication of the idolatrous fornication is their extreme faith in that religion they're made drunk through the wine of their fornication okay so Jeremiah 5, 51 7 says Babylon 
has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Get it, get it here. They're drunk of the fornication of God, of the wine of the drunk of may of the wine of her fornication, and therefore they are mad. They they don't realize what an apostasy they're that they're in because they're made drunk from it. The comparison here is with Babylon of the Chaldeans and the spiritual Babylon, Mr. Babylon the Great. Both had seduced their inhabitants into idolatrous fornication. The prophet Daniel and Apostle John both bring similar looks at the apocalypse being the uh, revealing of the of the of another time of the future that's what apocalypse means um, Isaiah 21 9 reveals that Daniel will declare that the Chaldean Babylon has fallen and he did back in Daniel 5 30 31 while John declares a spiritual Babylon will fall during the seventh week of Daniel as he does in uh, the next chapter Babylon has fallen has fallen um, the graven images of the Chaldean Babylon were broken down, and the graven images of the Babylon the Great will also be broken down as prophesied by John. Now, both the Chaldean and the spiritual Babylon have made the nations of the world drunk from, for, from their fornic the wine of their fornication, right? All right. So we move them on to verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this verse is one that coincides with Revelation 12, 3, the dragon that has seven heads and ten horns, seven heads with crowns, because those kings with those with the seven heads with crowns of the kings had their their uh, kingdoms during the church age and then you'll see 13 1 the antichrist the beast comes out of the sea out of the people so he's human he has seven heads and ten crowns but the crowns are on this on the ten horns this time and so they those ten horns have their their dominion during the seven years then you see this one here in 17 3 the false prophet, the second beast, the one that rises out of the pit, the spirit. Um, this one has seven heads and ten horns as well, and the ten horns have crowns. So the same as the 13 one. So you see the correlation. The satanic trinity is between those three passages. And the, the ten, excuse me, the seven heads and ten crowns, or ten horns, excuse me, are what links them as this, as together in this prophecy as the satanic trinity that's what the lord showed me all right so let's get back the same cherub angel carried john away apophoro in the spirit noma okay away means apophoro in the spirit noma in the revelation 110 john was praying in the spirit when he heard the lord's trumpet voice being in the spirit can be best understood as being at one with the lord in your spirit the holy spirit and your spirit are joined through prayer or in this case carried away by a spiritual force that's being a cherub angel we are to interpret this verse in its allegory the wilderness is allegorical for a land of desolation just like you saw in that isaiah uh, verses uh, uh, before about the land the desolate land just as the scapegoat was sent into the wilderness w with the sins of Israel, so they would never be seen again. That's Leviticus 16, 22. The wilderness. It's it's a place where God doesn't bless. It's where the sins are hiding of the of, of Israel and all that. The desolation is to be away from the blessings of the Lord. In the land of desolation, wilderness, John had seen a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast. All right? That scarlet-colored beast is the false prophet okay the one that rose up out of the out of the, the, the spirit that rose up out of the the bottomless pit the scholar colored beast all right that is the the false prophet all right the woman being the church the, the roman catholic church sits upon the false prophet okay now, this false prophet you'll find to be interesting. Well, we'll get to that soon. The cherub angel provided John with an explanation of what this scarlet-colored beast was within 17, 8 through 11. He is the second beast of the Revelation 13, 11, right? The second beast rose up out of the pit. I have been explained by the Lord that this correlation between the seven heads and ten kings 
of these Revelation 12.3, 13.1, and 17.3 are that they reveal the interconnection between the dragon, Satan, the first beast, Antichrist, and the second beast, false prophet, of Revelation 17, 3. The seven heads and ten horns are explained in Revelation 17, 9 through 14. The allegory becomes more upsetting to those of the Roman Catholic Church. They live in denial that their church is as evil as this. For now, I will explain that the woman represents the church itself, members of over 1.2 billion people of the current age. The woman has been is seen riding upon the spiritual leader, the, the, the scarlet-colored beast, which is the false prophet. He's the religious leader, too. He will be later explained to be the second beast, false prophet, of Revelation 13.11, out of the earth. We can confirm that it is to be the second beast because it will be the second beast who ascends out of the bottomless pit, as Revelation 11.7 says, who, who then, uh, in 11.7, he, he's the second beast, the false prophet, who kills the two witnesses of in 11.7. But 11.7 also says that he rises out of the pit. So you know it's the second beast. And 17.8 have declared it. They rise out, out of the pit. We must remember that the first beast, Antichrist, ascends out of the sea, world population, right? So he's human. As per Daniel 9.26 states, people of the prince to come, right? The, the people of the prince to come, the prince that's to come is the Antichrist. The people of the prince are the Romans. So you can see he is of Rome. As well as the Revelation 13.1, beast rise up out of the sea, right? He's... He, he wrote out of the sea. Sea is allegorical, well, allegorical for people. So the Antichrist is human, rose up out of the people. Now, there are a wide range of names of blasphemy that can be pinned on Roman Catholicism. They have named various evil men and women as being saints through the ages when it can only be God who would actually know who is saved and can be called a saint. The invisible church can be noticed by their faith in the gospel and good works performed, but that can be even misleading. The blasphemous names of other cults in the occult have been recognized through the papacy as being acceptable to God, which he cannot delight in. Their false accusations against the true Christian faithful has led to them being called names, which only true heathen would deserve to be called. The history of the Jesuits, Society of Jesus, has become blasphemous to even associate their name with the name of Jesus because of their secret acts of bloody violence against the true Christian church as well as the Jews through the last 400 years. Once again, in the latter verses, the cherub angel also explains that the seven heads and ten horns represent as well. Rather than explaining it twice, please uh, bear with me. I'm going to say read it further if you're reading the book, but bear with me. We're going to get there. All right. Verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, the woman, the church, is arrayed in a way that only can be identified as the Roman Catholic papacy and her purple arrayed bishops and her scarlet arrayed cardinals. No other dom dominant religion can be specifically identified in this way. As one will also notice, the Pope is usually adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. So I'm going to bring you down. Um, take a look at this picture. I mean, I'm bringing it down to you right now. I mean, there is no other religion that can fit this description as the Roman Catholic Church uh, Papacy has. There's purple, Scarlet, you can see this is f former King Pope Benedict the 16th. You, you can see the pearls, the diamonds, the gold. I mean, they're arrayed in them. They, 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 they bleed wealth. <laughs> As one cannot help but notice that the Roman Catholic Church uses a golden chalice in her filthy communion known as the tram substantiation. Um, their fornication is emphasized by faith that the Pope, Cardinal, or Bishop is able to transform the wafer and wine into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ, thus sacrificing him each time within each service. Meanwhile, with their literalness implied, they heretically become cannibals as a poor witness of the spiritual truth of John 6, 
51 through 71. If you read John 6, 51 through 71, it's Jesus scaring away the unfaithful using the future communion process of, of the bread representing his body, the, the, the wine representing his blood. But he said, if you can't eat my bread, can't, if you can't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be of my kingdom. It kind of scares everybody away. But the, the Catholics, the Vatican, the evilness has twisted John 6, 51 through 71 into um, a cannibalistic act. It's heresy. Their fornication, their idolatry can be seen all around the globe as they kneel, pray, and kiss the feet of statues of Mary, Christ, popes, and declared saints. All right, we'll move on to the chapter, or skip chapter, chapter 17, verse 5. <laughs> and upon her forehead was a name of written mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The woman, the church, had allegorically written upon her forehead the associated name of her affiliation. The mystery religion of Babylon is called Mystery Babylon the Great. The Roman Catholic religion, church, is being called Mystery Babylon the Great. While Christians have God's seal upon their foreheads allegorically, this church is sealed with the Antichrist seal upon theirs. Please keep in mind that the church of Thyatira is one of the seven churches of Christ, in Revelation 2, 18 through 29, does have actual Christians sealed by God within their cult, occult church. And we will see in Revelation 18, 4, that Jesus will call them out of her before the religion is destroyed. All right, so I'm acknowledging it here that the Church of Thyatira is Roman Catholicism. And in both cases, uh, in Revelation 2, 18 through 29, and 18, 4, Jesus is... Um, given them instructions that they need to obey. Because this occult cult religion has been dominant over the last 1600 years, she has seduced the earth into many adulterous acts, as well as supported the other adulterous religions, false religions, into continuing in their antichrist worships of idols, images, and other forms. Roman Catholicism has been accused of being an instigator for the creation of Islam, the LDS, the Mormon community, or Mormon church or whatever, Jehovah Witness, the Watchtower, the Jesuits, and the other smaller religious sects. They have encouraged and supported all other religions. Thus they are the true mother giving birth of the world's idolatry, harlotry. The Greek word that was translated is porne, which we get the word pornography from, which is translated into harlot which is another word for prostitute. In God's eyes, any form of spiritual infidelity is fornication or prostitution. The proclamation of heretical doctrines against God's word is considered to be abominations against him. In their 1600 years of heresies, they have used their power over the masses to inflict such heretical doctrines as purgatory, which they call a place of suffering first when they die for a very long time before ever going to heaven because one's sins must be burned away before they can go to hell. Or, um, I'm sorry, heaven. Oxymoron or a slip of the tongue there. Um, Catholics... Catholics believers, Catholic believers, I, that's a nest I need to remove there, isn't there, are led to believe one can pay money to shorten a loved one's time in purgatory after they die. This cannot be found anywhere in scripture. Other practices such as infant baptism, the use of holy water, rosary beads are used in worship which are found nowhere in the Bible as well. Biblical Christianity believes that the authority of God is declared through his word in the Holy Bible, while no man has the authority to change it. The papacy introduced a catechism to declare their doctrines to their congregation. The, this Roman catechism was and is honored above the Holy Bible. To prevent people from knowing the truth about the gospel, the papacy would eventually declare it illegal to own a Bible from 1199 until the Reformation that started actually in the uh, mid 1500s or early 1500s. Um, to the time of the Reformation, okay, I already said that. The Pope is declared as the Holy Father as well as the divine authority on earth, even over the Holy Bible as the Word of God. And Jesus said, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. That's Matthew 23, 9. So right there is a heresy that they're declaring the Pope as their holy father. 
another heresy. Now, during the Crusades, Pope Urban II recruited convicted criminals to fight in the wars, while in return he granted them salvation from the wrath of God. Though this may have been a sign of their faith, but was misplaced towards idolatry and the worship of their Pope, and not in belief in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Overall, the Roman Catholic faith is not one of grace through faith in the finished works of Jesus Christ, but it is one of the of works faith in their popes leadership and their church traditions that's an abomination of the earth a personal relationship with a christian okay a personal relationship which a christian has with god is not encouraged okay in roman catholicism for roman catholics it is only achieved eventually as one is called to god in spite of being affiliated with this cult or cult or cult all right Verse 6, And I saw the woman, drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Allegorically, to be drunken with blood indicates that one has been heavily involved in the murder of a sect of people, whether it be of a religion, culture, or society. The woman, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, has had their garments stained with the blood of the Christian saints and martyrs over the last 1,600 years. In a book written by M. D. Aletheia, the, the Rationalist Manual, published in 1897, he wrote that approximately 56 million had been murdered by the Roman Catholic Church between fifth, the 5th century and the 15th century for not accepting the Roman Catholic doctrines. This number has increased three to four times more, even more dramatically, over the last four centuries, if one were to consider the secret societies of the Jesuits, the Illuminati, and the global elites, who have been all guided by their leadership in the Vatican. Remember, it says, where do you get this leadership in the Vatican from? Well, God tells us this. This, this chapter itself, chapter 17, God says that they have been guided by the Vatican. The blood of the saints can be categorized as a genocidal attack upon Christian communities, battles of wars against Christians, as well as victimization of Christians with the use of physical persecution. The blood of the martyrs is a physical attack upon Christians witnessing for Jesus in a public view while being attacked by Vatican sent assassins. John saw the blood drunken woman church in an allegorical sense, and he, in the word. Thamazo mean, uh, can mean wondered, and then Thama um, is greatly, wandered greatly. Um, how, how such a powerful, influential, uh, uh, sorry, let me go back here. John saw the blood drunken woman in the allegorical sense, and he wondered greatly how such a powerful, influential, and abominable church could still exist and be called Christian. Don't be fooled by the translations. John in no way admired this abomination, but he had such tremendous wonder or marvel in this ungodly yet secret evil that mankind had fallen for. The blood of the saints can be categorized as a genocidal attack of the Christian communities, battles of wars against Christians as well as victimization of Christians with the physical persecution. I already read that. I'm sorry. Da, 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 sorry. I'm uh, reading it all over again. All right, verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Okay, all right. So the same cherub angel from the seven cherubim of the seven vials continued addressing John concerning this vision. He asked John a question. The Greek words for wherefore are, there's two words, dia, which means reason, and tis, which is what, which should be used to ask by what reason. The cherub angel asked, by what reason did you marvel? He then explained to John that he would explain to him the mystery of that, of what the, this woman was about, as well as who the beast will be, whom he saw carry her. Now, verse 8. Now we're getting into some, some, some theology and some extra stuff here that's very juicy and very upsetting. It's very upsetting, especially to the Catholic, Roman Catholics. The beast that you saw was and is not. Okay, what does that mean? Was alive 
and is not. So the beast was and is not. So he's right. This beast is rising from the bottom of his pit from hell. The bottom of his pit is hell. So this this beast, second beast actually, was alive and is not. He's the spirit, right? Can we get that so far? All right. And he shall send out of the bottom of his pit. See that? So it's a spirit coming from hell. Okay, and it goes into perdition. Eventually, Jesus is going to cast them into lake of fire. Okay, so that's what that means. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the world. When they behold the beast that was, is not, and yet is. Now here's the first beast. He, he was alive, and then he's not and yet is he's been resurrected hasn't he so that's the beast and they wondered after the beast that was that was and is not and yet yes he was resurrected oh my now as what can be deciphered from the previous places in john's visions the beast who ascends out of the bottom of his pit is the second beast of revelation 13 11 through 16 because we know that second beast will come up out of the earth on day 1261 now, I want to explain something here because in my other videos I've explained this, but if you're watching this and you haven't seen my other videos, then you know about you don't know what's going on here. On day 1261 is the first day of the second half. There's 2520 days, 1260, 1260. So day 1261, first day of the second half. On that day, many things happen. The seven trumpet judgments all blow simultaneously on that day. All those trumpet judgments are rolling and happening. Now, on uh, well, the fifth trumpet is pretty significant because that angel that comes down with the key to the bottomless pit, he opens the bottomless pit, the great and strong locust people come out. Also, the beast from the bottomless pit comes up that day. How do we know it's that day? Well, we're finding out that um, he was with the beast when he declared himself the, 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 uh, as God as, at the abominable Des desolation on day 1261. Also, you'll notice that Satan had fallen with his angels for, after the battle in heaven on day 1261 as well and gave power to the beast, as mentioned in chapter 13, for 42 months. So there's another thing. The two witnesses are killed by the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, the second beast. The, the false prophet, they're killed on day 1261. Now, I'm making an, a proposal, or uh, I'm, I'm going to throw in that it could be that Satan gives the power to, to the Antichrist. He declares himself God because of this. He says, I'm not doing this anymore. This Satan saying, we're not doing this seven-year covenant anymore. Heck with that. Heck with these, these, these sacrifices. Declare yourself God. And he does. Well, the two witnesses come in and say, how dare you? You can't do that. He's, and then the false prophet jumps in and kills them. So that's just a scenario proposing. Okay. There's nothing really that says it, but it all kind of makes sense. All right. So let's move on. All right. Where have I not written, wrote, read yet? Let's see. All right. As what you can have deciphered from the previous places in John's vision, the beast who ascended out of the bottomless pit is the second beast of Revelation 13, 16, or 11 through 16. Because we know the second beast will come up out of the earth on day 12, 61. I did read that already, didn't I? This will be the second beast who will cause the wound to be healed, which, which will resurrect the first beast on the same day. That's another thing on day 1261, the resurrection. Possibly the the two witnesses, maybe they did look like they killed him with their fire out of their mouths and so forth. So that's another thing. So that day, day 1261 is just one heck of an eventful day. Now, um, where was I? Second piece, cause wound. Um, he will also kill the two witnesses, two anointed ones, on that same day. I already said that. Revelation 13.3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Just like it's what's saying here, because they all want, shall wander, or shall wander after, after the beast. 
Those that dwell on the earth, the world, will wonder concerning the resurrection of the first beast. The satanic copycat event, the resurrection, just like Jesus, my God, came and died for me on the cross and resurrected. He is my God. Well, in this case, Antichrist, the son of Satan, not the son of Yahweh, but the son of Satan, is going to die and be resurrected. And so they're going to declare him as their God. It will cause the entire planet to be amazed that their hero had been resurrected. Because of this, he will become a God to them. These people of the earth will take the mark of the beast and not have their names written in the God's book of life. Right? Okay. The second beast, false prophet, is identified as the one who was at one time alive, but is not anymore. He was and is not, right? Upon the opening of the bottomless pit on day 1261, he will ascend out of the bottomless pit, where he will have been since he had died. He will truly be a spirit of, the once of his once alive mortality. He will heal the wound of the first beast, who, will, who was born of humanity, the, the Antichrist. Therefore, the first beast is identified as the one who was alive, then is not, and then is. All right, is resurrected. All right, he's he's a, he was alive, then he's dead, is not alive, then is resurrected, is alive. The wonder will be towards the first beast, as stated in thirteen three, because he will have been healed and resurrected. The satanic copycat again. All right, verse nine. And here is the mind which have wisdom. The seven heads and of the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So finally, we got some answers. What are the seven heads? All right. Of all three scenarios, it, the seven heads are linked. So Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are all the the, the, or the satanic trinity. All are affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church. They are all affiliated with it because the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. The cherub angel states that those who have wisdom will understand what he's applying. Here is verse 9. There is a huge clue to the identity of the woman, the whore, because she sits on a place with seven hills. The Greek word aros is defined as either mountain or hill. Now, translators were afraid to say hill because then they would be persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. The same with your English translations and everybody's afraid to put hill there because then it'll say seven heads are our seven hills and they go, oh, seven hills Rome, these are the Catholics. So Roman Catholicism has prevented any this word to say hills but instead every translation says mountain just to throw everybody a little curveball oh seven hills oh that's rome yeah well the location of the roman catholic vatican is a place known as seven hills okay the seven heads the independent city-state was established in 1929 by the lateran treaty which was signed by cardinal secretary of state Petro Gaspari in behalf of Pope Pius XI and by Prime Minister Benito Mussolini in behalf of King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy. Because the Vatican had found itself to be a city-state, its status changed to an independent country. Therefore, the leadership of that country is found to be as royal kings who rule over their country. Therefore, the beast that the woman whore rides upon has resided upon seven hills, its statehood, and has ten horns yet to be determined or explained. All right? So that's the seven hills, the location that the, the beast resides in. The, 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 the false prophet resides there. Okay? That's, that's what it's saying here. And all the kings after that. And we're going to get to that king's part real soon. All right. In fact, this verse. Here we go. This is exciting because it's revealing things. Hopefully you're understanding it because it's all intended for you to understand if you could just put two and two together. And if you weren't throwing curveballs by the Vatican, trying to not pinpoint them as being the topics of the chapter 17 disclosures. Now, verse 10. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Okay, so obviously you know what five or fallen means, right? Well, the seven kings. What does this all mean? What kings? Okay, let's, let's break it down. 
In continuation from the previous verse, the cherub angel states there are seven kings. That has nothing to do with the seven heads who ended up being hills. Seven hills is where they're located. But the seven kings resided there. That's where they resided was in Seven Hills, right? So that's how they're associated. Until 1929, these particulars concerning the woman could not have been known. This is officially the very first end times prophecy to come to pass. The first king, Pope, began to rule over his country in 1929. Israel was declared a nation again in May 15, 1948, 19 years later. So the first end time prophecy is not the 1948 Israel declaration, but the the Pope ruling over his country in 1929, that is the first end time prophecy to come to pass. It started happening there. Now, the Apostle John saw this vision during the reign of the sixth king, which was Pope John Paul II. The one is, see that up here? Five are fallen. One is. And the other is not yet come. So, did he see it during the first five? No, he saw it when the sixth king was sitting on his throne. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. It's pretty clear to me. As you can read, there were five popes in the past, beginning in 1929. The first five kings had died. Five were fallen. Already by the time John saw this vision. Okay, now we're going to go up here. I'm going to show you all the popes past to present. Pius as you saw, Pius XI was the one that was rep being represented when the treaty was signed. Um, then there's Pius XII. Then there's John the Twenty-Third. Then there's Paul the Sixth. Then there's John Paul the First, the one that just lived 33 days uh, while in office. And then John Paul the Second, who one is the one that John saw, the Apostle John saw in the vision. He the, he's the one that is in. He's the one that is alive, or so in office. And then the one that's to come was Benedict the Sixteenth, And then the one that's current is the eighth one, Francis, right, the first. So let's break this down even further because there's a lot to it. After Pope John Paul II had died, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth became king and ruled a short time because he chose to resign in 2013. Notice that the seventh king was to come and rule for a short space of time. Interestingly, Pope Benedict XVI ruled for a short space because of his resignation. Okay, now the eighth king is now reigning over the Vatican, who is named Pope Francis I. Alright, so we are, have you followed me so far? This is easy if you take it slowly and break it down. Now, Verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the, of the eighth and is of the seven, and goes into perdition. Now that needs broken down, huh? Well, we already know who the beast was and is not. The, the beast from the, from the bottomless pit was alive and is not. So he's a spirit, right? It says, even he is the eighth. Well, Pope Francis is the eighth. So he's not a spirit. Pope Francis is flesh and blood. He's, he's still alive, isn't he? Wow, this is interesting. He's the eighth, Pope Francis, but yet the false prophet was and is not even he's the eighth. Now, here's the key right here. And is of the seven. So the, the false prophet, the second beast, w was alive and is not. So he's a spirit. All right. And he is of the other seven. This is a demonic possession here. The spirit from one of the seven popes of the past is going to enter into the eighth king, who's Pope Francis I. Now, it's not happening now. It's not happening next year. This is going to happen on day 1261 of the seven years. Because he's going to be a physical body with the Antichrist. Joining him in the, at the temple. Reviving him from the dead. He, people will be able to see the second beast. The, the false prophet. They'll be able to physically see him. So this is what it is. 
if the false prophet ascends from the bottom of his pit, the second beast, and he is of the eighth, but is of the seven, he's, this, his spirit is one of those seven, and he's going to enter into the eighth king who's going to be alive at the time, right? I mean, that, this, 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 uh, my faith in, in the word of God gives me that I know that Pope Benedict, uh, Pope, I'm sorry, Pope Francis is going to live in, on into the 70th week of Daniel because this says it, this, this says he will, because we have history that shows that he, that he, that he is the eighth king already. In continuation from, from the previous verse, the cherub angel declared that the second beast is the eighth king. If the second beast was, is alive, but is not, but he comes up out of the bottomless pit, he will be a spirit without a body. This is a satanic copycat of the Holy Spirit. A spirit cannot be seen because they move without physical form. John 3, 8 says, this is Jesus speaking, The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So he's, Jesus is kind of defining what a spirit is, so to speak, there. Now, therefore, if the eighth king, Pope Francis, is alive in a physical form during the time of the opening of the bottomless pit, the spirit of the second beast will ascend and enter into the eighth king. The eighth king will have an unholy spirit possessing his body, a demon, as the third person of the satanic trinity. Even he is the eighth. The eighth king will go into perdition and hell when Christ returns, obviously. Now, this next paragraph is going to upset some people. I'm doing some speculating, a little bit, but I'm going by what the, what seems to be right. The curveball being thrown here is the fact that the second beast, who was alive, then dead, is dead in hell, is not alive, was one of the first seven kings, is of the seven. If we should understand that the Lord is a God of order, then the identity of that dead king, the Pope, would be obvious to us. Since the Apostle John was taken to the time of the vision, which had Pope John Paul II on his throne, that it would be his spirit that will ascend up out of the bottomless pit. Therefore, the second beast, the false prophet, will be a person of Pope Francis, physical body, who will be possessed by the spirit of Pope John Paul II, who will be rising out of hell to possess Pope Francis. And together they will be the false prophet. All right? So, I know this is a bit odd, a bit strange, a bit upsetting, a bit amazing, but take it in. Take it all in. It's going to make sense to you. Read it again, read it again, read it again. Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. The cherub angel continued to explain the vision that John had seen. The beast, which the woman was riding, had the ten horns as well. The ten horns are allegorical for ten kings, which will have a kingdom for a short while. The allegory one hour is not to be interpreted as a literal hour, but represents a short time compared to the seven years of time. During the first half of the seven years is when the, their kingdoms will be given their short time, but will hand over their power to Antichrist at some point in the second half of the seven years. How do I know that? Well, follow me. Verse 13, these have one mind, they're talking about the ten kings from the previous verse, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. The one mind is allegory revealing that they will rule in unity as one a world world governmental system. Together they will support to the first beast, Antichrist, which will give him power or, and strength over the whole world. For someone to have power and strength, they need complete cooperation from the leadership. Okay. There is already a move towards this one world order in the world to, today as we live. The satanic realm insists to remain silent in their intent, but yet continue to take away governmental sovereignty from the existing nations. Eventually the Lord will let 
them have their way as they had desired in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, when they persisted to stay together as one system of people to build their tower of Babel. All right. Now, here's the verse that's key for you understanding why I knew that the time frames of the, the um, ten, 10 kings handing their power over. Daniel 7.20 gives us an important fact or prophecy. And the ten horns out of these, this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Another shall rise after them, that's the Antichrist, and he shall be diverse from the first. And he shall subdue three kings. All right. So the three kings of the ten will be subdued. Now, doesn't mean he's going to kill them. Doesn't mean he's going to hurt them. He's going to subdue them. All right. Daniel 7.20 indicates that Antichrist will rise after the ten kings will have risen to power, which notes that the ten kings will have their crowns before Antichrist will rise to his position of power. This confirms that he is given the power as of day 1261 and not before. Remember, Satan gives his power to the beast, first beast, on day 1261. For 42 months from that point and not before now the ten kings here in Daniel 7 20 says that they shall arise and another shall rise after them okay so the Antichrist rises after them after the ten horns right so if the Antichrist is given power in day 1261 it means the, the, the ten kings have their power in the first three and a half years they get their power then. But then in the second three and a half years, they're going to give the power over to him. So there you go. I, I said nothing that was untrue. It's all per what the scripture says. Daniel also implies that Antichrist will subdue three of the ten kings. This could be the determining factor which will motivate him to cause the short time, one hour, to elapse as he causes the ten kings to hand their kingdoms over to him. The allegory intended for the expression one hour should not be understood as 60 minutes, but is, is to be considered a short duration of time compared to the 2,520 days of time. Now, could it be that the the three three kings that he subdues were actually kind of questioning his power? And he said, oh, no, you don't. Not the heck with this. You guys are all giving me your power, and this is it. And maybe he, that's the manipulation that happens here, some pushing and shoving. All right. Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they are, are all with him, are called and chosen and faithful. So this verse is kind of key, which what is said following. This is a prophecy which applies that the world governmental system will be so evil that they will desire to destroy, make war, the one with, with make they'll destroy the one who is responsible for their suffering. They will not care nor believe that Jesus is the God of the Bible, nor that he is the one who can give them salvation or could decide their fate and eternal sufferings and spiritual death. Yes, the Lamb of God will overcome all of them in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, Kedron Valley, and will have decided all of their fate. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be a glorious return for all who believe that he is God and their Lord and Savior. Those will look forward to his return and will be his called and chosen and they will be and they are his faithful and 1916 uh, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh his name written king of kings lord of lords so it's just kind of confirming what we've just covered now there's a reason for this verse being here all right and that's because of this verse and he said unto me the waters which you saw where the horse sits are the peoples and multitudes and, oh i'm sorry verse 16 my bad Forget I said it had to do with this verse. 14 has to do with 16. All right. This is just a um, allegorical um, definition, I would say, is the best thing to put here. It's a definition of what waters or, or sea, the sea means. The same cherub angel is noted to explain here of what the allegor allegorical waters pertain to. This explanation is helpful for all other prophecies using allegory since God is consistent and never changing. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So we have learned here in this verse that a body of water, whether it be a lake or sea or ocean, is allegorical for multitudes of peoples and nations and tongues. So the cherub angel implied that the whore sits on the multitude of nations and tongues of people. Most religions will have some sort of 
presence and a multitude of nations of people. But the identifiers of the previous verses can only be the one worldwide dominant religion, which is known as Roman Catholicism. They have been estimated to to consist of 1.2 billion people around the earth as of 2020. Jesus said, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way, which leads into the, into life, and few there be find it. So 1.2 billion people, not too many of them are going to find the way, right? All right. Now, the multitudes of people and nations will not find their way into everlasting life because the whore has misled them into thinking that her way is the right way. Okay, you get down. All right. Now, here's the verse. When it said that these shall make war with the Lamb, the Lamb will overcome them. All right? Okay. So they hate the Lamb. They hate Jesus, don't they? The one world order. The, the world government hates the Lamb. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her fi with fire. Now, you, are you getting the drift? Okay, I'll, I'll fill you in. The cherub angel continued to explain the allegory of, to John. This was so that he could better understand, but better yet, so that we could understand. The ten horns, the kings of the one world government system, will hate the whore. Why? Because they hate Christ. All right, uh, you Roman Catholic people are going to like this. You'll like this part. Um, the one world government system will hate the whore, the Roman Catholic Church. The resentment will be because there will still be those in the congregation resisting them because they will be hopeful followers of Jesus Christ. The thought of Jesus offends those of the satanic realm. The ten kings will be followers of the first beast, Antichrist, and his father, Satan. They will desire to destroy her, the whore, by making her desolate and uninhabited. Her nakedness will be her shame from persecution while being driven away from their church buildings, naked and exiled. Unlike, un, unlike the last 1600 years, she being the whore will no longer have the support of the world's governmental leadership. She will be just naked. All right. The allegory confirms here with what the world governmental system will do to the whore, the Roman Catholic Church. The Greek word phago is translated as the word eat. It would be better to use the word, which is also an uh, definition, devour or consume. The translators use the word flesh for the Greek word sarx. This word can also mean body. Now listen, it is entirely common for us to refer to the church or congregation as a church body. Christians are of the body of Jesus Christ. The world government system, Ten Horns, will consume the church body of the Roman Catholic Church through persecution and death. The church of Thyatira will be put through extreme tests in order to bring them through the fire of persecution, burns her with fire, so that they will seek a true relationship with God and depend on him for their protection. So here you have it. You've got people that are Jesus's and he's going to He's going to cause them to bend their knee. They are already somewhat faithful to the Lord, even during these nasty times in the seven years. But they've been in the Catholic Church and protected and so forth because it is the Catholic Church and the buildings and all that. All of a sudden, the ten horns say, what is going on here with this? Why do we have these Christians still on the earth? And just because it's Roman Catholicism, ha! Ah! And they're going to persecute the woman persecute her, burn her with fire. Now this burger with fire can also be from chapter 18 where the actual literal Babylon, Mr. Babylon the Great, the, Rome is actually burning then. Um, it could be that as well, literal, but I believe it's more allegorical, the persecution, because they will consume her body, church body, burn her with fire, the fire of persecution. That's the direction of that verse. 17, 17, for God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their, their kingdom unto the beast and to the words of God shall be fulfilled. The word for is interchangeable for the word because. This verse is the reason that the world government system, the ten kings, will be perse persecuting and even killing the church body of the Roman Catholic Church, the whore. God had put it into their hearts of the evil world government to persecute the body of the whore in order to cause his own people to repent and seek him. This is not the first time God's ever done this or ever will, or might be the last time he ever will, but 
persecution brings people to their knees. Persecution brings faithfulness. Persecution brings people's need for God. So God has brought persecution in the past to bring his people closer to him. So here it says it, for God hath put it in their hearts. And you know that they're persecuting the whore. They're not persecuting the whore just to punish her. They're persecuting the whore to bring God's people to repentance. The evil ten horns, ten kings, will agree to give their kingdoms over to the Antichrist, the first beef, beast, until all that God has spoken has come to pass. The words of God should be fulfilled. This is obviously the second coming of Christ, where he will take back this world to be his kingdom from the first from the beast, Antichrist. And then the last verse, and the woman which you saw in that great city is that great city, is that great city, okay? The woman is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now the cherub angel continued to explain allegory to John by implying the woman, Roman Catholic Church, is that great city, Rome, mentioned in Revelation 16, 19. That is why great Babylon, spiritual Babylon, came into God's mind when the great city was to be divided by the great earthquake of Revelation 16:19, Unlike what the majority of the population of the earth may think, the Vatican of the Roman Catholic Church rules, reigns over the majority of the kings of the entire earth. Though many will speculate, there is no disclosure anywhere on the planet of, of the net worth of the Vatican and Rome. The works of Satan is hidden and never out in the open for the world to see. And I've looked for some sort of indication of the wealth of the Vatican. I've seen their investments some places where they don't even give how many shares they own or whatever. They just don't disclose it anywhere. The involvement in the internal affairs of each governmental system uh, is never disclosed while the satanic realm deals with the overall motivations of the world elite secret societies. God has disclosed it right here in this verse that the world governments are under absolute control by that great city, which is the woman, whore, called Roman Catholicism. So here's the, the, the verse I was telling you about earlier. The Vatican rules over the kings of the earth. It says right here, the word of God says, the woman reigns over the kings of the earth. So you can't deny it. It's, it's there. It's in the word of God. All right. So that's the conclusion of chapter 17. Hope that you enjoyed it. Probably scared a few people. Probably shocked a few people. Roman Catholics are probably enraged right now. I don't, and, um, bear with me. I mean, if you have questions, put them down below. I'll be glad to answer them. If you have um, rude remarks or um, want to argue, I will delete you. Okay? So keep that in mind. But questions? I'm a scholar. I'm, I'm, I'm a theologian. I, I have my MDiv. I am qualified to answer your questions theologically. Ask me. Give me a like down below on the, on the video and subscribe to me to get other information. Until the next day, um, may God bless you. Have a great night.